Excuse me. Can I quit this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I told Eddie Murphy to stay in college so he'd have something to fall back on. <laughs> I did great advice. <laughs> Jackie, how about the lighter side of history? <laughs> the lighter oh, side. I'm done laughing at my joke. Okay. I know a lot of things and I share them on the podcast and you don't care. What are we talking about? We're <laughs> I can't get a word in edgewise <laughs> on, on this show. I mean, it's. Here's how we sell it. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, take my advice, pull down your pants and slide on the ice. That was how my friend and fellow musician Chris Bates started every one of our shows that we played together for 20 years. And um, I had to do it in homage to him. But uh, this is actually the first annual Jackie Martling Arm Wrestling Championships. And this is Peter Bales, who's here tonight to throw out the first elbow. <laughs> <laughs> It's a joke I heard when I, I, that I read actually in Mad Magazine, like in the 50s, and I thought you'd be thrilled with that. Um, that's going to be the last um you're going to hear from me. Peter Bales is a comedian and a history professor, not necessarily in that, not necessarily in that order. He was my first professional comedy friend, I think, who knew me. The reason I wanted to play a song today is because when I met Peter, I still am not clear where we met, but he used to come to see my band play. He could have cared less about my songs, <laughs> but we packed in the women at the Rum Runner in Oyster Bay yeah. every Tuesday night. Everybody from three towns around came to see me and another guy play guitars and get drunk out of our minds and have a wild time. And then we started doing shows in Huntington, and Peter showed up and said, hey, I know you're from your band. And we've been fast friends ever since. We've been through all the wars together, all the travel gigs and everything. And I just thought it'd be fun to have him on here and talk a little comedy and <laughs> talk a little everything. I'm thrilled to be here. Jackie started in comedy by doing jokes in between songs. But what a great way to start. Theoretically, it sounds better than it was because I actually did that in high school. We had a band in high school. It wasn't like, hey, we're going to do a show, and here's some band, and here's some comedy. It was like just stupid me telling <laughs> jokes in between. And people, for the most part, forget about laughing. It was more like, what are you doing? <laughs> and if that wasn't bad enough, when I got to college, I would do that. And we're playing like Gimme Shelter by the Rolling Stones. And then I'm telling it. A dirty joke, and everybody's <laughs> scratching their heads. The, the ultimate was we played one of these Friday afternoon shows for a couple of fraternities at their, in their big uh, fraternity house, and it was a big, huge wooden dance floor, but the guys were here and the girls were there, and they hadn't mixed yet because it was a Friday afternoon, and the idea was the guys met the girls, and then they went on dates that night to the big parties. <laughs> And here I am, a freshman or a sophomore in college, and I had been in gymnastic team the whole high school, whole high school. And I'm standing with my guitar, and there's this big gymnastic floor, and I just put down my guitar, and I did my gymnastic routine. And if you think they were scratching their heads when I told you, <laughs> the guys in the band were like, what was that? I, said, I don't know. No. Jackie, you're talking about high school and college. I can go back to fifth grade. I was at a barbecue in the 90s in Bayville, in my brother's soon-to-be wife's backyard, and your fifth grade teacher was there. And we made the connection. And I said, do you remember Jackie Martling as your student in fifth grade? And she goes, yes. And I go, how was he? And she goes, that was it. Nothing. No speech. Nothing. No words. Just. No, this is in Mrs. Ginsburg. Could have been. A little tiny Jewish Could have woman. been. Could have been. She was your teacher in fifth grade. You traumatized her. Now, my, what was the class? My you? fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Ginsburg, sent me to the principal's office for calling the Jewish kids bagel benders. <laughs> and I swear to you on all that is holy, I had no idea what a bagel was. 
I didn't even, I didn't know it was disparaging. I just thought it was funny. It was a funny <laughs> word. And I didn't even know what it was. Well, we know what kind of a student you were. You have the famous picture on your album cover of giving the finger. What grade was that? That was, that was eighth grade, <laughs> Miss Beglin. It's so funny, there's a, there's a girl from our hometown who's a very dear friend, Dee Dee Walsh, and there were like 12 kids in her family. So there was one in every thing. And the people, the, the teachers from our little town wound up down in Oyster Bay in the main thing. So the teacher that was in the, in the class, you know, the, the teacher from that homeroom where I'm flipping the bird was Miss <laughs> Baglin, and she had moved down to Oyster Bay. And I was, I loved her. She was so good to me. She woke me up in the morning, made me come in early to learn mathematics, you know, higher math, which I'm sure got me through engineering school because I had such a, you know, yeah. it started me on a, on a quick path. And she would call me at home and get me out of bed. I mean, <laughs> you know, a small town. So she's in Oyster Bay, and I put this album out, and I'm given the finger, but I got my own comedy album, so I'm so <laughs> proud of it. So I sent it to her, and Dee Dee Walsh's younger sister was in the homeroom, and she's like, oh, I got some mail from a former student. And she said she opened it up. She didn't see the finger, but on the back of the album were like 10 disgustingly <laughs> filthy song titles, fake song titles that had nothing to do. And she started, re she didn't read them out loud, but she said, tears came to her eyes. <laughs> like, the point here is, you started early. Ah, we, you we, started early. We all start now. The reason, <laughs> the reason I want, uh, I especially wanted to start with you is last week I, or a month ago, whenever these things air. I said everybody's done all kinds of podcasts, and I would really like to go back and find out what got people going. The way I explained it last week is, if you're a singer, a Broadway performer, a comedian, anything. I've always said the, we face the wrong way. We're here and they're there. We're facing, and of course to us, we're facing the right way and they're facing the wrong yes. way. But the point is, at some point, you stepped over that threshold and became the person, you know, of course you're, you're at a bar telling jokes, I tell a joke, you tell a joke, <clears throat> but when it becomes I'm telling all the jokes and you're watching and you're the audience, I was trying to figure out the spark and I explained my whole thing about being in a family with um, my mother and father were married to a brother and a sister. You know, I, you know, my father's brother married my mother's sister, and I had four parents for the first two years, so I was the center of attention. Okay. And I'm sure that had something to do with causing the spark of, hey, I'm the center of attention. At what point? Now, see the trouble with. Do you have that moment? Do you have that spark? Can not, you? Not that distinct moment, but. The way I tell it is I had my mother and my father and my father's brother and my mother's sister and I had four parents and then after two years my mother had another kid, my aunt had a kid, my father started drinking more and I went from four parents to none. I mean I had four parents in the same house. They must have wow. logged every single thing I did and I spent the last 71 years going like, where'd everybody go? You know? <laughs> I have that spark. I have that moment. You, you know the moment. When I was in 11th grade, I was in Brigadoon and we had these shows over a four day period. I, I had the comedy role. I stole the show. People were looking at me differently. I felt super. And I went into comedy because I love the feeling of there's a show tonight and I'm a part of it, and it's as simple as that. I, that's my moment. It, it wasn't just getting a laugh, it was, no, I'm in show business. It was deeper than that, I needed it. I literally needed but it. But that, 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 that was your iconic moment, or was? That was my moment. But that, there was no, no inklings along the way, like a small play in fifth grade, or in seventh grade, or? I'm, I think that was my moment. I always liked plays, but. But there had to be a reason you got the, the because comic lead. I was funny. I was funny. I wasn't great at sports. Uh, it's Robert Klein who says, you know, I had no punch, but I had punch lines. Jimmy Brogan, we know him. He's a great comedian. He had a great line when people ask him, why'd you go into comedy? He would look at you straight and go, because when I was a young boy, I was scared by a serious person. <laughs> That's, That's great? So great. That's a great line. For you people that don't know, Jimmy Brogan yes. was the head writer of the Jay Leno show. And for you people that don't know who Jay Leno is, I'm not sure why you're watching us. <laughs> but uh, Brogan, that, that, that's so great. You know, I, I, I said last week, 
I'll never forget, I read that um, Henny Youngman said the definition of a comedian is somebody who said something funny at a family reunion, and one of his uncles said, you should be a comedian. <laughs> and, then, and that's all it took. Now, that's, what I was going to say is it's not really a fair thing to ask, because if you ask anybody, you know, why'd you start playing the guitar, 99% of everybody that plays the guitar will say they did it to meet girls. And the other one percent are lying, <laughs> and I actually saw the exact quote from Billy Joel. I mean, that you know, I, I was I was in eighth grade, and I wasn't, you know, I was a loudmouth, and I was pretty popular. But I saw my friend Chris Bates had a guitar, and I thought, wow, that's cool, and that's that's another step up. And I said, hey, you play guitar, and he said, yeah, I could teach you four chords, and we could have a band, and he did, and we did, you know. But it was, it was all, I don't want to say it was all about the women because, but the. It wasn't like, I really want to learn music. I really want to learn songs. It was like, I really want to meet girls. How do I do that? Teach me a song. Yeah, but you, the music might have been about women, but your comedy comes from your childhood, from your upbringing. It's in your gut. I truly believe that. And I could see that in the Butcher song. I, it's, 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 it's so funny. I, I, I can't remember ever not telling jokes. And the more times... I talk to people, and my mother comes up. My mother said so many funny things over the years, and you don't even realize how much of an influence different things are. It's like my, my friend Burf always says, does a fish know it's in water? You know, my, my mother said so many funny things, and I would say them to people. It, I remember I live in Bayville, and yeah. it's so beautiful, but it's Bayville. And then you go away to college, and you bring home your college roommate, and you're driving along the, the water, and he's like, Holy mackerel, look at this place. And all of a sudden you're like, <laughs> yeah, holy mackerel. I start saying my mother's lines like, I don't know how it came up, but, uh, but somebody's zip was down. I said, yeah, whenever I was a kid, my zip was down. My mother used to point and say, <laughs> she'd say, ever ready Eddie. Which is, you know, but to a five-year-old. I know, but so your mother told jokes and now you tell jokes. There's a, there's a connection Such there. Such a direct, you know, and I had a, a, a book, the, 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 the Treasury of Laughter, with all the the little Willie Dirty Johnny jokes, oh yeah, and yeah, yeah. She and and I actually started. I still have it, a little joke book on one of those speckled notebooks where I started writing things in it. Right. She added a couple of jokes, and they, and they're they're off color. There, there was uh, the priest was uh, was doing his his sermon, and somebody yelled fire. And the priest jumped out the window, and he missed his donkey and landed <laughs> in a freshly dug grave, which just goes to show that that priest didn't know his ass from a hole in the ground. <laughs> yes. But I'm like seven years I know. old, and my mother's right now. I know. You know. You're a prodigy. Yeah, it, it just, it just, it puts you on that path. You know? But your family puts you on the path. This is what, I always say this, and it's true. Two male comedians are getting into a car, getting ready to drive three hours to a gig someplace. Guaranteed, uh, one of the comedians is going to say to the other, so, do you want to talk about your father first, or should I? <laughs> right, right. It's true. But it, your mother might have been more of the influence than your father. Yeah, my father was, was relatively quiet, I think, in, in, all, in all the years. I think, I think he told five jokes. You know, it's funny, there was like a couple that I remembered, then slowly as time went by, my memory unearthed another one and another one, and they are fairly off color. And he yes. was, you know, but he was very funny. And but they, th but those were actually he told jokes. My mother never really told joke jokes. She just yeah. was funny and 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 outrageous. My own father had an incredible sense of humor, but it was a different generation. It was so my father remembered vaudeville, and I remember when I first started out in comedy. He he says to me, "Come here, come here." I got a joke for you, you can do in your act. Uh, I met my girl in a revolving door and we started going around together. Dad, say, I don't, what do I, it, Dad. What, well, <laughs> I go, Dad, it, it, comedy's different now. I, I didn't know really what to say. I mean, but that was his help. He was helping me. I, I, and you know what? And it's funny. <laughs> you know, it is it's funny it's, in a way. You, it's, it's, oh. I always tell people, but tell jokes of all kinds, you know, <laughs> and you know, for about this, that, and disgusting, and not disgusting, and offensive, and not offensive. 
And when you're a kid, it's so funny how your, your sense of humor evolves. Because I remember as a kid in 1955 watching the Jackie Gleason show. And the Jackie Gleason show was originally five or six segments. He had like maybe 10 characters. And, and the first segment would be Rudy the Repairman. And he's yep. a fix-it guy with, a, with an actual midget, with a little person that was his helper. And then there was Reggie Van Gleason III, who was the rich guy that was a drunk. And there was the poor soul that didn't talk. And each one, and for a kid with no attention span, it was wonderful. Yeah. Because it would be ping, and it would always keep changing. And then the end, the last segment, was the Honeymooners. Yes. And I remember as a kid going, oh, <clears throat> well, here's that, that crappy marriage stuff. And then it slowly, they started making the honeymooners longer and longer. And I got less of the little guy with the repairman. And the, the honeymooners went from 8 to 12 to blah, 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 till it became the second half hour of the show, which now is so classic. Yeah, and as a little yeah. kid, you yeah. listen to Henny Youngman, and he's funny. But, but so what? And as you get older... Yeah. And you get a girlfriend, yeah. and then you get married, and then you're married a while. His jokes get funnier and yeah. funnier. Yeah. And I actually lived a couple of Henny Youngman jokes. It just made me laugh out loud. I remember me and Nancy, my ex-wife, yeah. you know, I, I love her. She's my best friend, but we, we didn't get along that well. And I remember she was going away to Jamaica. I couldn't go anywhere because I had to stay home because I was on the radio. And I had to drop her off, you know. And then it was car phones had just been in bed, and the car phone rang, and I answered, and they said, Jackie, what are you doing? He says, <laughs> I said, I just came home from a pleasure trip. I took my wife to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> That's I a said, great well, line. But I'm living a, I'm living a real life Henny Youngman joke. Now, I, I know you love old joke books, and I read an article about Flip Wilson, who said that on vacations, when he had time off, he liked to drive across the country by himself going to libraries and digging up old joke books. And so much fun. It's yeah. so much fun. I have always done that. Um, when you were a kid, in fifth grade or third grade or whatever it was, I'm sure they pass out to you the, the sheet where you can order books at a very yeah. good price. <laughs> and like Peter Bales would buy The Yearling and Bob <laughs> Nelson would buy Catch-22 and Jack and Martin would buy the seven joke books that they had. I always bought all these joke books. And I've always dug into them. And when I was in my band, it's so funny because we played for the entire 70s and we, we I didn't just tell jokes between, I, we told jokes between songs, but that was our act. <laughs> Yeah, we did crazy yeah. routines and all kinds of, we were, we were horrible, but we were fun. But we worked for the same people every Thursday, every Saturday, every Sunday, you know. Nobody ever told us that a comic tells the same, does the same act and rotates the people. So here <laughs> we are with the same people every week at all these clubs. So we're going crazy trying to find jokes and, and I do everything I could and you know these things in the back of uh, comic books where they'd say, you know, Columbia Record Club, any 12 albums, and I defy somebody to find an album they like. And they would take any, any 10 books for one penny. And I'm looking at the, and I saw this book. And it was called Rationale of the Dirty Joke. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> wow. And I sent for it. But this is 1976. This is no internet, nothing like that. And I get this, and it's the most amazing thing it's this thick, and it's so pedantic. And it talked the guy tell the reasons and the, and the explanations and where he heard it and blah, blah, blah. But he was kind enough to make the jokes themselves in italics. So if you do want to just read it as a joke book, you could. <laughs> of course, I knew almost all the jokes anyway. But it was second of a series. And like I always do, I looked in the forward and got the guy's address in France, and I wrote to him. Wow. And said, listen, I can't find a copy of the first series of your thing. And the guy wrote back to me. I sent him wow. I sent him our comedy cassettes and everything. I don't know if it's ever going to get to him. Like France Valbon with a, <laughs> with a postal code. And he said, I love your stuff. Uh, I have two copies of the first series. I only need one. He sold me the first one. And, it's, and it had his writing in the margins for, oh, for wow. his, the corrections for the second edition, which was never going to happen. And we became fast friends. And when I started making a lot of money, I would send him money because he was an expat. He was a professor in Pennsylvania. 
but Pennsylvania University wouldn't recognize joke collection as a viable, mm. you know, form of uh, sociology or whatever. Right, their loss. So this guy Gershon, Gershon Legman was fantastic, and we wrote back and forth and blah, 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 and then one day I noticed that the last joke on the last page of the second edition, I don't know, the second series, was the aristocrats. Oh! So I freaked out, and what's so interesting, <clears throat> this guy's entire premise was that you're defined by what you think is funny. And it's pretty, it's pretty astute if you get to it, and I'm reading, I, I had already, I had heard the aristocrats, that th these books are so thick, it's like yeah. the Bible. You can, you can only read a handful of pages. Not that I ever read the Bible, but <coughs> but I had heard the aristocrats and I had told it a bunch of times and I went wild telling it and having fun with it. And, and comics didn't go around telling jokes. Comics don't tell jokes. <laughs> that whole thing was such a, a sham. But but I loved it. Oh yeah. And I see. And the important thing it says. And here is the the classic one of all time because the last section of the last book was all about kids and and foulness and family foulness, which is the whole aristocrats thing. It says, the following joke was, you're defined by what you think is funny. Yeah. The following joke was told to me as his favorite joke by a comic magician who said he was raised in a family that did nothing but battle and scream, but the parents stayed together for 40 years for the sake of the children. <laughs> it's like, holy Great joke. Christ, that he just described my family. Great and joke. So I freak out, and I loved it, and I wrote to him, and then 20 years later, I put out my joke book in 1998, and then as an homage to Gershon Legman, The Aristocrats is the last joke on the last page. Good. So when they were making that movie, Penn Jillette and, and Paul Provenza came to my apartment, and they said, Martling, you're really not famous enough for this movie. But we have to put you in it because we did a <laughs> we did a search on Google and we under the aristocrats and there were only two hits and they were both because I had put his <laughs> yeah, version yeah, and yeah, my yeah, version yeah. both. Good. Oh, that's great. Just amazing. You I know. have a great joke about you. You're known for your catchphrase after doing a great joke and getting a big laugh, turning the crowd and going, "Come on!" And I was thinking. Can other occupations do this? Can a doctor finish a successful operation, step back and look at everybody in the operating room and go, come on! <laughs> That's funny, I love that. Where did the come on come you from? You know what? I don't know, I'm pretty sure I didn't do it in my band, but I, when we, when I started producing shows on Long Island, there were no comedy clubs, you know. Yeah. And you have to get the people's attention you know, they'd be drinking and doing whatever. I mean, I remember climbing up and turning off the hockey games, and yeah. lucky I got away with my life. And I think I just screamed, like Joe Mullen down in Fort Lauderdale Comic Strip used to love to watch me. And when I'd yell, come on, he, he would turn to the other guys and say, he will not be denied. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it was funny because when I got to know Bob Woods, and we had a very good friend who's a very heavy guy, passed away a long time ago, but he's a comic. And we'd work gigs together. And he was a guy that always took things that people did. And he, you know, he'd be talking yeah. to me and he'd go, come on! And finally one night I said, what is this come on? <laughs> he said, that's you, man. <laughs> because it's like somebody that says, you know? Yeah, you know, yeah, You don't yeah. know you're doing it. Once he said that, I was like, come on! <laughs> and I realized, and one of my early cartoons is a, is a cartoon of me holding a, a telephone from my 922 wine, and there's a little uh, cartoon bubble that says, come on, you know? And yeah. I don't, it was just to try and oomph the laughter, you know? I'm already <laughs> laughing at my jokes, I might as well berate people too. <laughs> I love it. Come on, you guys. Come on. on. That's a good one. It also comes from uh, working some pretty tough gigs. Exactly, you know. And you, you know, when you gotta say, come on. Yeah, th so they'll know it's the end of the joke. And. <clears throat> I think that audiences got educated by going to comedy shows. Uh, when we were starting, they didn't know how to behave at a comedy show. They didn't know what they were like, what heckling was, what you could do, what you they couldn't were, do. They were facing the wrong way. They were facing the wrong way. No, it's true, it, it, because everybody was so used to watching television, and if somebody's on television, they're a comedian. <laughs> but when you take somebody that's the same age as you or close to it and put them on the stage, 
and they're like, all right, I'm going to stand up here and be funny. Like, you know, who died and made you boss? You know who yeah. was facing the wrong way? The mayor of Bayville, when you had a <laughs> packed house, usually successful show. You want to finish that story? Because it's now it's funny. Hey, a new episode of Stand Up Memories every Wednesday. How exciting is that? Starring me, Peter Bales, and right here, Jackie the Joke Man Martin. Please follow us on social media, search it out. What is it, MeSpace? MySpace? Your space? TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Do da, do da. <laughs> <laughs>